Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Ashland County Historical Society. I'm Jenny Marquette, the Executive Director at the Ashland County Historical Society, and we sponsor a speaker series in the spring each year, uh, January through May. So this year we will have five different speakers, one each month. And tonight we are happy to welcome Ken Hammondry. He is going to be portraying Johnny Appleseed this evening. I hope you find this very interesting. You know, Johnny Appleseed was very important to our area, the development of our area. Um, he was a very interesting man, and so Ken is very learned about this subject. We also have Keith Goins with us here tonight, and Keith is a good friend of the Historical Society. He comes to a lot of our events, and he loves setting up all different kinds of um, little um, genres that represent different things that we talk about. So he's doing this tonight for Johnny Appleseed and he's come many, many other times um, in our Veterans um, Committee and he has set up war scenes and different things. So I invite you, um, as Ken talks about this, to come up and kind of look at what he set up up here because um, we've tried to make it as realistic as possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you um, Mr. Ken Hammontree as Johnny Appleseed. John Chapman, if you may. John Chapman. John Chapman. All right. Well, this is my kind of weather. <laughs> I love this weather. Weather the problem or not. is, I lost my brother Nathaniel in this weather. Uh, Nathaniel, my younger brother, and I go all the way back to um, La Munster, Massachusetts. I know some of you probably can't spell that word or probably even say it, but it's, uh, it's in the East Coast. And that's where my brother and I originated from, Nathaniel. Come on in there. Did you get lost in the weather too, like my brother did, Nathaniel? <laughs> well, my brother and I started a new nursery not too far from the little village of Mansfield, about 28 acres. And... Uh, the 28 acres is going to be a seed nursery. Now, right now, my brother Nathaniel and I own about 1,200 acres, which you probably were not aware of, in uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and some down in uh, Virginia. And most of those are what we call seedling uh, nurseries, where we grow the apple trees to sell. And right now, this being the year 1820, uh, in Richland County, my brother and I probably are the wealthiest two men in the newly formed state of Ohio, which was illegitimately formed in 1803, but I don't even think they ever signed the paper, so Ohio is not a legitimate state. But uh, that will be for another time. But anyways, my brother and I have come a long ways and I would like to know where he is. Has anybody seen Nathaniel, my brother? I, I worry about him because he's a mute. And he really cannot communicate to people other than through sign language, which both of us have learned from the Seneca Indians when we formed our first one acre of Sydney <coughs> apple trees on Broken Creek Straw, which enters, of course, into the Allegheny River. Uh, so I do worry about him. So if you do see him wandering about, remember, he can't talk to you. He will use sign language. So hopefully some of you, being uh, in this area uh, of a wilderness, will be able to communicate with him through sign language. Well, some of you are probably wondering, you want to hold my apple, man? Don't, don't eat any of it, please. Uh, <laughs> where this all started. And uh, my brother, Nathaniel, and myself, our connection to uh, uh, this, uh, this area. Now you have to remember, Richland County stole, or was it Ashton County stole uh, a lot of land. Uh, I think it was Ashton County stole land from Richland County. So there's still a lot of people that are upset over that. Uh, it's like, you know, the, the state of North Michigan is upset, you know, because supposedly a lot of the illegitimate state of Ohio uh, took some of their land up by Lake of the Cats. So this land situation would just go on and on and on. But my brother and I tried to stay out 
of the political arena. And we just basically want to plant apple trees and sell apple trees. And right now, because of uh, the aftermath of uh, the War of 1812, there are a lot of widows. And uh, outside of churches, who are supposed to take care of the widows and the orphans, and I hope they do, a lot of these widows have no means uh, of support. And many of them are on the outlying areas of Richland County in the wilderness. So my brother and I try to help where we can by giving them apple trees, by spending some time on their farms, chopping wood, taking care of the gardens, that sort of thing to help them out. My brother and I grew up right after the American Revolutionary War. And come on in there, young man. And uh, all these individuals are getting lost in this, uh, this weather. This isn't bad, is it? This is not bad. You know, I sleep out in this kind of weather, you know. And uh, I'm sure some of you do too. But uh, we started right after the Revolutionary War. I don't know whether you know too much about uh, myself and my brother Nathaniel, but uh, we're proud of uh, our father. Our father fought with uh, General George Washington, and he was with Washington's army all the way up to Valley Forge. He was one of the original Minutemen at Lexington and Concord. And from that point on, he was heavily involved uh, in our independence from Mother England. Unfortunately, when our father, Nathaniel, was off fighting the Revolutionary War, uh, our mother, who was expecting a child at that time, uh, passed away. And she died. And a few days later, my baby brother, who was born to, into the family, also passed away. Uh, back then, they buried them both in the same uh, coffin. You understand that. Uh, they waited to see if the mother was going to live or die, and then they would place the baby in the coffin in the arms of the mother, and that's what they did. My father was not aware of the death of his wife until weeks later because of the communication and sending letters, obviously. But when my father left uh, with an honorable discharge from uh, Washington's army, he came back to Longmeadow, Massachusetts, and it was there that he, of course, uh, was in mourning, but he realized that he had a daughter, my older sister Elizabeth, and myself at that time. We were uh, being taken care of by our uncle in Longmeadow. So, they suggested to my father he needs to get married. Well, where is the better place to find a woman than church? And he started going to this Methodist church in Longmeadow. Now, my father was 54 summers old at that time. And he met this young girl who was 18. Her name was Lucy Cooley. And a few months later, they did not prolong anything. They got married. And out of this marriage, I ended up with 12 stepbrothers and stepsisters. It was a large family. But most families were large back then, as you probably, all of you have come from a large family of 10, 11, 12 uh, individuals in your family. You had to, obviously, didn't you, for survival. The problem was my father was not an officer in Washington's army. So when the war was over, the United States government set up land tracts at a little settlement where the Muskingum River empties into the Spraley Wikipa, that's an Indian term for the Ohio River, and it was named after Marie Antoinette. We call it Marietta. And that whole area of Marietta basically was for Revolutionary War officers. And my father, of course, could not partake in any of the land grants because he was not an officer. So we were very poor. When I was about seven summers old, and my younger brother was about five or six summers old, we got a job at a cider press mill. Are you familiar with that, with the large rocks? And the oxen uh, would go around and around, and that huge stone would grind the apples. And 
Uh, they would, uh, of course, uh, have their, what, apple juice, uh, apple jack, uh, apple cider, all sorts of good stuff. But at the end of the day, the floor was just lined uh, with pomus. You know what pomus is? It's kind of mushy, isn't it? When you step on an apple, that's pomus. But in that pomus were thousands, hundreds, sometimes apple seeds all over the floor. So it was our job to take a broom and to sweep up the pomus. And as we were doing it, a few years of doing that in Longmeadow, we realized if we could take these apple seeds and plant them in a nursery, a seedling nursery, we could become very wealthy. But we knew we could not do it in the eastern states because everybody and their grandma had apple trees. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison. They all had plantations and they all had apple trees and fruit trees. So they would not be interested. And beside that, they went the way of Satan because they grafted their trees, especially Thomas Jefferson, really disappointed in him because that is not how God intended us to grow apple trees. God wants us to grow an apple tree by taking the seeds, like in the Garden of Eden, plant those seeds and allow that tree to grow about this height and then dig it up and give it to somebody worthy, a righteous man or woman. I'm a little disappointed in Thomas Jefferson. He's really the one that started grafting those trees, and that's bad. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that at all. I'll be good. Okay. All right. Well, where are we going to go? We can't go to Maine. We can't go to New Hampshire. We can't go to Virginia. I mean, apple trees are everywhere. Where is there a place where there are no apple trees? <coughs> The land of milk and honey. There's no apple trees in Antarctica. I don't, I've never heard about Antarctica. I thought he was going to say Ohio. <laughs> Ohio. Ohio. No apple trees. Now they have the crab apple tree, but we're talking about Jonathan apples, okay? Rambo apples, golden delicious apples. These are really good apples. And we had the seeds. And so we would gather the seeds up in bags. We would place uh, uh, beeswax over and around the bag to uh, seal it from water. And we decided we were going to traverse across Pennsylvania following General Braddock's trail. You remember General Braddock? Sure. He wasn't too smart, was he? He, he started out with an army of 2,500, and he ended up with an army of about 500. They were all massacred and ambushed. Uh, and he was not too smart in that. But one good thing he did do, he blazed a road across Pennsylvania all the way to Fort Pitt. Someday you might know that as Pittsburgh, but we know it as Fort Pitt. Before, you probably remember it as Fort Duquesne. You remember Fort Duquesne? Fort Duquesne yeah. I thought you looked like you were a Fort Duquesne man. <laughs> but uh, Fort Pitt, and there at Fort Pitt, we realized that all these Immigrants were coming down, all these individuals were coming down from Maine and, and from New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, they were coming down and they were gathering at Pittsburgh, Fort Pitt, and there they were going to travel down the Spraley Weepipa into the Ohio wilderness and start a new life. But they didn't have any money. Come on up, honey. You look like you had money. Oh, we're going to sure. <laughs> okay, I see what you have on. I love that. Just show everybody what you have there. Show. Okay, everybody see that? She has no money. But she's married, and her and her husband have 14 children, and they live in Maine. And they decided they're going to move from Maine into the land of milk and honey because they received a, a grant because your husband was in George Washington's army down by a little village called Belle Pre on the Spring Weekly the Ohio River. But you're going to have to make your way there from Maine. So they sell their farm. Everything. They purchase a Conestoga wagon. 
and a huge Conestoga wagon pulled by four oxen. And they traversed down across General Braddock's road that he graciously cut out for us all the way to Fort Pitt. And at Fort Pitt, they take this Conestoga wagon. They sell it. And they purchase a keel boat. Whoa. 40 foot long. 25 feet wide, and in that kill boat, they placed their chickens and their oxen and whatever Little worldly goods. goods they have. But there's one stipulation. <laughs> in order to establish a farm in Belle Pre, they have to homestead. Mm. And the United States government said, you can homestead, we're going to give you this land, but you have to have at least 15 acres of apple trees or some type of fruit tree. Mm hmm Homesteading. They didn't have any fruit I trees. I love apples. All right. So, she's going along the wharf down there just before they leave it, and she sees all my apple trees lined up on the wharf for a flip penny bit. That's a lot of money. A flip penny bit. She doesn't have a flip penny bit. I don't have it. Her and her husband have no money. Well, nobody had any money. Barter. I got a chicken. Now, I... No, but I, I see what you've got on there. I like that. Oh, okay, she. All right, she's going to give me this. I'm going to give her 15 apple trees. And she is going to traverse down the Spraley Reefa to that little acreage there by Belle Pre, not too far from Blennerhassett Island. Of course not. And there she is going to establish their farm and plant my trees. Thank you, honey. Be seated. Now, you begin to multiply that by hundreds and hundreds of people coming down to Fort Pitt buying my apple trees to bring it into the Ohio wilderness. And before long, my apple trees started growing everywhere. And we decided we need to move into Ohio. So up the Muskingum River, uh, the Indians call it the... Uh, uh, the CP, the Muskingum CP, all the way to a little town called Goshaka. Goshaka, where the Tuscaroras River comes down uh, along with White Women's River, someday that might be known as the Wahonding, and together they form the mighty, dirty, muddy Muskingum. And there at Goshaka, we established 30 acres with the help, of course, of the Delawares, 30 acres of apple tree seedlings right there. Eventually we work our way up Mohegan Johns River all the way up to a Frenchman who started a little village called Jerome Town. And there Jerome Town about five miles west of Jerome Town there was another village called Green Town. And about five miles Further west from Greentown, there was a little village called Mohegan Johnstown. And not too far from Mohegan Johnstown was a little town on a hill overlooking the Black Fork of the uh, 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 Mohegan River called Helltown. Now they call it Helltown because it was a, a French word that a lot of the settlers mispronounced. It really means clean, clear water. So you had all these villages, and I had all this help that I needed. Because as you know, my brother Nathaniel and I, there was no way that we could take care of all those seedling apple trees on the various nurseries that we have. We had to have help. This is where the Native Americans come in. Now, I have here my wampum. This is a white wampum. This means peace. This was given to me by Captain Pike. Captain Pike was one of the influential uh, Indians of the tribes down there at Greentown. This was given to me to show all the various tribes coming into Greentown and Jerome Town uh, that I am peaceful. Let's consider this my hall pass. And I could travel, traverse through the wilderness even when Tecumseh was doing his mischief and gathering all the various tribes together to push the white man out of uh, this area, back across the mountains of smoke, back across 
the stinking sea and those silly little boats and to regain the land that the white man has taken from the various tribes, especially in this area. As long as I had this, when I would go into Jerome Town or Green Town or Hell Town or Mohegan John's Town, I would carry this and they would know right away. Eventually, I wouldn't really even need this because who else looks like me in the area? And they love me. Do you know why the various tribes loved John Chapman and my brother Nathaniel? Because we treated them like human beings. And a lot of the white people did not. And this is where we're going to get into the story of what happened not too far from here. And it was a tragedy that did not have to take place if everyone would have listened to John Chapman. The United States went to war with England again. Lake of the Cats, which is incorrectly called Lake Erie, named after the Erie tribe that lived on the uh, southern shoreline. Lake of the Cats, we always refer to that because of the lynx and the bobcats. If you know the difference between a lynx and a bobcat, they were everywhere, along with black bear and everything else that would go along with the forest. And so a lot of the war of the 1812 came down to the Great Lakes. And some of the settlers in Richland County were a little concerned because Jerome Town and Greentown and Helltown and Mohegan John's Town was right there in their midst and they only had one blockhouse at that time. So when the war broke out, the first thing that the 20-some settlers, that's all that lived in Richland County, they built two blockhouses in the little village of Mansfield. One blockhouse was in the center of town. The other blockhouse was a little further west. Then they built another one down by Beams Corner in a creek area. So there we have three blockhouses. And then they built two blockhouses in Mount Vernon. Now let me tell you about Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon has been given over to Satan. You do not want to go to Mount Vernon. They have more bars and saloons and taverns in Mount Vernon than, uh, than Mr. Cleveland did when he started his little settlement up there with a Cuyahoga empties in the Lake of the Cats. Moses Cleveland. Nothing good will ever come out of Cleveland. I can tell you that. But do not go to Mount Vernon. Okay? But they did establish a blockhouse, two of them in Mount Vernon, because everyone in the community, they were afraid. They were afraid that the various tribes that up to this point are peaceful in Ashland or Richland County would take the side of Tecumseh, Wishikatui, Nakuda, Fanawa, Udawa, Tecumfa, and attack their cabins. The good people of Richland County got together and said, we've got to do something. We have to clear out Greentown we have to destroy Jerome Town. We have to get rid of the various tribes at Hell Town and Mohegan John's Town. We have, to, we have to eliminate all of that. They're too close to the village of Mansfield. They're too close to Mount Vernon. We have to do something about that. And they came to Martin Ruffner and they asked him where I would be at any given time during the week, and I spent a lot of time in Greentown. Those were my friends. They took care of my nursery outside of Mansfield. They made sure, can you, do you understand what a bear will do to an apple tree? Raccoons? Rabbits? <laughs> yeah, they would strip that apple tree pretty quick. So all our orchards were protected by the various tribes who would build a fence around the orchard, divided up into one acre sections, and they would use that, uh, oh, what's that? It looks like a brain fruit. You know what I'm talking about that falls from the tree? It looks like a brain, okay, with the real long thorns on it, okay? 
we called it like a, a, a crab apple, but that's really not the name that eventually oh, will become. Oh, but thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But you know the little, uh-huh. So they would take that, weave it, make a fence to keep out most of the critters. But once in a while, a critter could get through that and destroy a tree. They loved us, the various tribes, especially the Delaware. But we knew that there's going to be problems in Richland County because the settlers were now afraid of these peaceful Indians. It reminded me what happened about 25, maybe 30 years ago at Jehaden Hutton. You remember what happened? Where Williamson's party came in and killed 109 Moravian missionary Indians for no reason at all. Of course, because of that, Colonel Crawford paid the price. But all I could vision would be another Jehaden Hutton massacre in Richland County. So I went with Martin Ruffner. We went to the uh, Zimmer family and to the Herod family and to a few other families that lived on the outside of the mass-filled little village in the wilderness and we tried to warn them, get out. Get out, but do nothing to Greentown, to Jerome Town, to Hell Town, to Mohegan John Town. Leave them alone. Well, they said, Johnny, Mr. Chapman, they are going to go the way of Tecumseh. And they are going to join up with Tecumseh, and they are going to push the white people out of this land that belongs to them. Tecumseh had gathered a force of some 15,000 warriors. Of course, that was all destroyed at Tippecanoe, as you're well aware of, because of his brother, Tenswatka. But they were afraid. And so they got together and said, I want you and Ruffner and Zimmer and you, Mr. Chapman, to go down to Greentown and persuade them to leave before we will physically remove them. I said, okay. So I went with, especially with Martin. We went down there. We spent three or four days talking with Captain Pike, three or four days with uh, talking with Wasagaboa, and we tried to persuade them to peacefully leave, and they could come back and we'll make sure that all their property is protected and their wiggy ups are protected. So they agreed to leave. Big mistake. This man of Satan came from Mount Vernon by the name of Captain Douglas. Are you familiar with Captain Douglas? He brought close to 25 troops, militia, from Mount Vernon, from the blockhouses. He came to me and Martin. We told him they're going to peacefully leave on their own. They're going to go to Mansfield for a while, then they're going to go to Piac. Leave them alone. And they said, okay. So they waited till they all left Jerome Town and Greentown, Mohegan Johnstown and Helltown. And then they went in and they burnt into the ground. Every wiggy up was burnt. But before they burnt the housing, they stole everything they could. Blankets, beadwork, tomahawks, hunting rifles, took everything. Then they burned it to the ground. I took my family, my wife and my children, and we went up to the blockhouse in Mansfield. And we stayed there for three or four days. I went to the outlying cabin of Reverend James Copus, who was a local pastor, who the Indians loved as much as they loved us. And I said, please, Reverend Copus, bring your family up to the Mansfield blockhouse. There's plenty of room, please. He said, no. And then he said, yes. 
And then a couple days he came up and spent a day or two. And then on September the 14th, he left and went back to his cabin. And I said, well, at least take some soldiers with you that came up from Mount Vernon. And so he took five soldiers. And another two or three, I believe, I can't remember the exact number, came that morning. And uh, they, went, they were going to stay with Reverend Copas. September the 15th. Early in the morning, the soldiers got up. There was a spring, not too far, about 15 rods from the cabin. I've been there. I drank out of the spring, literally. About 15 rods. And Reverend Copas said, take your rifles. And they said, no, it's all quiet. Everything's going to be fine. So as the soldiers were washing up and drinking, from the spring, they were ambushed by 50 Delaware, Mohegan, Mohawk, some Ojibwa. We don't know exactly the various tribes that's been handed down, but we do know that the majority of them were Delaware. And some of them lived in Greentown. And some of them lived in Jerome Town. And some of them lived in Helltown. And some of them lived in Mohegan John's town. And they wanted revenge. They killed all the soldiers around the spring within minutes. One soldier made it into the cabin to be with the wife and the children. Reverend Copas grabbed his rifle and opened the door. And as the moment he opened the door, was killed instantly, a bullet in the heart, and he fell back into the cabin. The battle lasted till 1 o'clock in the afternoon on September the 15th. Finally, they gave up. The cabins were sturdy. Logs were thick. And as long as you would keep the chinking inside in between the logs, you would be safe. At 1 o'clock, the various tribes disappeared. Mrs. Copas sent their young daughter to Mansfield to the blockhouse. Can you imagine a young girl running through the forest? As she was on that main route going to Mansfield, she runs up, runs into guess who? John Chapman. Her dress was ripped, her hair tattered, her moccasins about ripped out, the thorns and so forth. She was hysterical. And I picked her up and I carried her all the way to the blockhouse. And they sent some soldiers down, but it was too late. It was too late for Martin Ruffner because several days before he was killed, as well as the Zimmers, Mr. and Mrs. and their daughter, Katie, were all killed. All because of what happened at Greentown and Jerome Town and Helltown and Mohegan Johnstown. Four years later, they tried to come back to Greentown and reestablish the community. But before 1812, there were approximately 175 Wigiups in that town, Greentown, right along the river. Four or five years later, there were less than 50. And a few years after that, just before I left to make my way to Indiana, the territory of Indiana, most of those were wiped out with measles. Because you see, some of the natives could not accept measles or mumps, and it could wipe out a whole village. So that's the sad tale of Reverend James Copas, Martin Zimmer, and the Ruffner that should never, ever have happened if those men and women in Mansfield at the blockhouse could have contained themselves and allowed Greentown residents to leave peacefully until the war was over or Tecumseh was gone and then allow them to come back because they contributed to the area in a big way, especially in farming. You have to realize, some of you 
probably lived in the wilderness in that area. Some of you look like you just came out of the wilderness in that area. And you have to realize, try to plant a garden. Huh? Try to clear one acre of land in the Richland County wilderness that was part of the hardwood forest. <coughs> I have letters from people that wrote me. And by the way, I can I speak seven languages fluently. You didn't know that about John Chapman. Okay, most of those are Indian tongue. And I can read and write because I have a sixth grade education, a Presbyterian education in Massachusetts. But imagine the letters that I have read in Marie Antoinette's town when that was formed in uh, before 1800, the trees, and I read the, I read, I read it. Trees were 30 feet in diameter. The average tree, 50, 60 feet high. It would go on and on and on, and it would take 10, 11, 12 men with cross saws and to cut down one tree and cut it up for logs. The same thing in Richland County. And the topsoil was four and five and six feet deep. How do you think Richland County got its name? Mm -hmm. Rich foam. But I can only imagine by 1840, 1850, most of that topsoil would be gone because the trees would be cut and the rains would come and all of that topsoil down Mohegan John's River, down the Jerome Fork, down the Tuscaroras, down the Muskingum, down the Ohio Spray, all the way in, down to the Gulf of Mexico. That's where all our topsoil is in the Gulf of Mexico. Sad story. But I'm sure glad that my brother and I never tried to build a log cabin and cut down those enormous trees. And one final thought before we have questions. I saw with my eyes because I wrote it in my diary. And by the way, I would carry books that you see up here. Most of these books, let's see, this one here is uh, 1830. This one here is uh, 1840s. I would carry books with me because most of you settlers cannot read or write. You probably cannot read or write. And I understand that. Okay? But too I busy would, living. Hmm? You're just too busy living. <laughs> You're too busy cutting down trees <laughs> and planting a garden. Well, so I would read. I told you 14 kids. <laughs> you were busy with 14 <laughs> children. Yes, you were. So. So I would, carry the, I would carry the word, and I would also preach. What was my thought before I, left, before I had a senior moment here? Oh, the squirrels. Yes, well, also, I wrote in my diary. I saw from my eyes the black squirrels coming from Kentucky, crossing the Spreely Weathapa, which was shallow back then. You realize that. The Ohio River was only three and four feet deep. You understand? That's why the buffalo... Their herds of buffalo could go from the upper Sandusky Plains. Millions of buffalo, more than the stars in the sky at night, and they would come down from Sandusky all the way down to Belle Pre, a little village of Belle Pre, and there they would cross the Spraley Weathy Pie into Kentucky at the Blue Licks. Three major herds of buffalo. I saw it. I also saw a black squirrel. Millions, and I do not exaggerate, come up from Kentucky, cross the Spreely Weeper Pie, enter the trees there at Marietta, and work their way to Lake of the Cats. And they really never had to touch ground. It was a magnificent hardwood forest. And I can only imagine someday it will be gone. And we'll just have a wreck. Questions for John Chapman? Yes. Um, of the Indians, how many tribes were there? Maybe half a dozen, six or eight? In Ohio? In Ohio. Ohio had five major tribes that I was aware of. Uh, the number one tribe, of course, was the Lenai Lenai tribe of the Delawares. Okay? Their main village would be a Goshaka. 
It's an Indian term that means large vi village. Someday white people will call it what? Koshaka. Goshaka. Okay, that would be your first Are they major. The most warrior like of the Indians? Uh, no, no, no. They were more peaceful. Peaceful. You're, you're talking about the Ojibwa, which would be up by Lake of the Cats. Okay, that would be their area. The Shawnee. The Shawandase, we shikat, I speak Shawandase, we shikat to we nakuda fanawa udawa shani would be in this area, this would be their hunting ground, they were very warlike. So now you have three tribes. Over more by Pennsylvania, you have the Hurons, the Huron River, the Vermilion River, the Hurons. Heading toward Indiana Territory would be the Miamis, and then a little further north would be the Kickapoos which would be a part of the Miamis. Those were your major tribes when I roamed the wilderness. The most fierce were the Shabandas. And you got along with all of them. I got along with all of them because of this right here. <laughs> you didn't have a hall pass, so you would lose your scout. Peace belt, okay. As long as they saw this, they knew I was okay. Besides that, a lot of people thought that I wasn't all there mentally. I don't know why they would think that. <laughs> I mean, women, would you marry somebody looking like me? Of course you would. You would, wouldn't you? She did. <laughs> Don't tell her about who you're going to sleep with. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, she tells, I don't know who I'm going to sleep with tonight. Tecumseh, uh, George Washington, Blue Jacket. <laughs> Yes. Were there any Indians that didn't like you? No. I treated all Indians like you would treat, like I would treat you. The settlers in this area did not like African Americans. They thought they were inferior. They did not like Native American Indians because they thought they were inferior. So they treated African Americans and the natives in a terrible way. Okay? I didn't. In fact, a lot of African Americans, of course back then we would call them Negroes, would work with me. I would live among them because they had their separate villages sometimes. No, they, we got along fine. But see, this is a lesson you have to learn. You have to respect and treat all people as you would want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And that was my secret on how I survived in the wilderness. Did you learn some things from the Indians? That you used? Well, they saved my brother Nathaniel and I when we first uh, left uh, Massachusetts. We left, uh, we weren't too smart. We left in September. By the time we reached the, the, the western end over by the Allegheny River, it was winter set in. And we, you know, we were city boys. And uh, we would have died that first winter. But the Munsees came in, took care of us, taught us how to build a wiggy up, how to build a fire in a weather like this right here. Anybody want to go out and build a, a fire right now? Yes. It's easy. <laughs> it's, easy to, it's easy to do. But no, they helped us. And so what I learned from them, of course, are survival methods of, of how I could live in the wilderness. I never owned a home because you know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, what? Foxes have their holes, birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So I, I would go by that. If Jesus Christ could not have a home, I didn't want to have one. And so we live basically off the land. Any other questions anyone would have? Yes, sir. Okay, now your story has taken us into Ashland County. And I was told that you, I don't know personally, but you planted seed all the way up through Ashland County into Savannah, like you went up 250. And how far did you? I don't know. You're talking talk about 250. Uh, there was a there was a there was a farmer that lived that someday there would be a little village in Savannah, and I can only imagine uh, that uh, that would be one of the few trees that would be authenticated as one of my trees uh, from my uh, orchard. If you want to read this article, uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer. If I could jump ahead, uh, interviewed me by this tree. And it is authenticated that that is one of the few trees. Uh, it's estimated it's 135 years old tree in Savannah, if you're familiar with that. And uh, I, uh, 
I've lived outside of uh, Moses Cleveland's community, but I didn't like it. And that's about as far north as I would go. I did plant some seedling nurseries around the uh, Norwalk area and that area, but I didn't go beyond the Lake of the Cats. And I stayed out of Moses Cleveland's town. Although I did traverse up and down the Cuyahoga. The Cuyahoga goes one way, which is very difficult, you know, because you're going upstream. And then there's a little bird called Akron, and there's a seven-mile potage. You know what a potage is, where you have to pick up your canoe, which we had to do, and walk seven miles, okay, where the headwaters of the Tuscaroras put our canoes in the Tuscaroras, canoe all the way down to Boshaka, make a sharp left, and you're on the Muskingum, all the way down to the spring of Wikipa, take a sharp right, work your way down to New Orleans. You can do it in one month. If you're a good canoeist, you want to try it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Other questions? I have. Uh, well, I know who lived in the blockhouses. Blockheads. The <laughs> blockhouses. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What religion then were you? Was because because I remember that you were. Uh, what did you say you? Sweetenborg. I was a devout Swedenborg. Okay. That was the, that would be the religion of Benjamin Franklin. And and were there um, was that religion here in Ashland County? Because um, I was told that there was a farm down by Jameson Creek, and um, they were the same religion, and you stayed there with them, and mm -hmm. we did try to. Um, Authenticate the trees, the apple trees that were grown there, and was not able to do that. That they were planted by you. But I just was wondering if you know. that's absolutely true, Jameson Creek. I was there. We had a seed, a seedling orchard there. As far as uh, me being a to proselyte people for my religious beliefs, uh, I had some converts, but not too many because the Swedenborg religion is is very different than basic Christianity. Uh, probably that's why Benjamin Franklin liked it. Uh, and uh, he was about as different as I, I would be different. Uh, but I, I made news in uh, 1830 in England because that's where the Swedenborg religion originated from. And they heard about me, uh, what I do, and I made the papers in London. So they knew about me in London, you know, long before I became known as uh, John the Appleseed. I was always known as John Chapman, the wilderness preacher. And I preached a lot in Mansfield, and uh, I was well received. But a lot of your frontier people were very religious, but they were also very superstitious. Okay? Very superstitious. And uh, life centered around two things in the wilderness here. Family and church. Family, church. Now, I can imagine eventually that will change. But right now, so they were very receptive. But as far as carrying on the Swedenborg uh, religion, I, I don't think so. I don't think it ever occurred. But I was at Jameson Creek. Absolutely. Did yes. You, Go ahead. When you were uh, traveling through Pennsylvania, did you come out around like the Mahoning uh, Indian tribe area, Mahoning River, or did you come out? South from there. We followed General Braddock's trail that he had hacked through uh, all the way basically to Fort Pitt. And then, of course, we established on Squirrel Hill, if you're familiar with Squirrel Hill outside of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, someday that's where all the millionaires are going to live because they went probably looking for my trees. But we had about 30 some acres of seedlings on Squirrel Hill. And then that's where we traversed up the Allegheny River to Broken Straw Creek, where we established other nurseries. And then coming all the way down, now we had two nurseries, and then we went all the way down the spring of the week of the Ohio River to Marie Antoinette's tent, uh, Marietta. So those are the three major areas where we had our trees. Primarily Jonathan, uh, Winesap, uh, these are all pre-revolutionary apples. Uh, uh, Jonathan's a big one. Rambo. You know, guys, we like our applesauce chunky, don't we? We don't want runny applesauce. And of course, a lot of the women would make applesauce with, with the Rambo apples. It would be nice and chunky. Nothing runny. 
Got it? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Did you meet the President of the United States? Who? George Washington? Yeah. Absolutely not. And I did. My father did. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was a good president. How about the Moravian people? Did you meet any of those? I mess up work. Well, you see what I have here. This is the Moravian Cross. It's made out of 50 caliber lead bullets. This was given to me literally by the Moravians. And where was that? Where did you meet them? Was that Ohio? I met them at Koshaka. Okay. Because at that time, the villages of Schoenbrunn, if you've been to Schoenbrunn, and uh, New Salem, most of those villages have been destroyed. All right? But I met, I met the remnants of the Moravians at Koshaka. I, my, my relatives are from Moravia. So I have... In Germany. And, yeah, and mm -hmm. they... Uh, well, I, was, I think it was more Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. But uh, they liked to sing. They were into music. Mm -hmm. my, uh, my grandmother liked to sing all the time. And my dad said that they, they were good at playing the piano. And I forget where, where it was, but uh, they got the Moravian link. I don't think there are any pianos in the Ohio wilderness, but no. maybe they brought the hard and brought my hand. But yes. No. You speak Russian, don't you? Uh, a little bit. I, don't know, I thought you did. Yeah. I can't. So I wasn't exposed to that. Yeah. I speak Shaman Dase. Yes. You said, you said you, you know, talked about your wife. You said something like I never had a wife. Okay, you didn't get married. No. Did you marry somebody who looked like me? <laughs> but God has promised me two wives in heaven. Okay, so some say that I was grooming women in this lifetime to be my wife in eternity. So I, that could be more fable or, you know. Like the, the pan on the head, a lot of I can only imagine someday a guy by the name of Walt Disney will come along and place a pan on my head and birds on my shoulder and a wolf following me and a bear. Of course, none of that is true. Right. What wow. you see, is that what I look, is exactly what I look like when I was here in Richland County. So as you move from one place to another, you've established a seedling I, farm. Seedling you farm. Get, you get that going. Now you move on. Do you leave people? To the various tribes. We various were tribes. And so they kept it and it gave them a way to then continue to make That's true. Come. That's why. Another reason why they love this because they received a lot of the mm -hmm. remuneration from that. Absolutely. The, um, the trees you were mentioning, uh, the average, the, those hardwood trees are average well over 100 feet tall. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. It's beyond our imagination of what the hardwood floors look like. Okay, I'm going to, Keith is just going to take a few seconds here and talk about this. Uh, has anybody been to where the Copas Massacre took place? Okay, there's a monument there. Have you been to the spring? There's a little spring there, 15 rod. I drank out of the spring. It's still there, water coming out of the side of the hill, you know. But uh, Keith, go ahead. This, he got this cabin, and I'm looking at that, and I'm going, oh, that sure looks like the pictures that I've seen of the Copas cabin, and it's almost identical. Go ahead, Keith. Hello, my name is Keith Quine.
and kind of see what early life was like back then. Not a whole lot of furniture probably, as a lot of it would have to be either handmade or probably bought or traded somehow in, through the bigger towns. And of course back then it was very rough so we'd have to come in on wagons and maybe some on horseback or mules, whichever they had. So again, if you'd like to come up here, please, you can come up here. And I'll leave, as a matter of fact, I'll leave this off so you can look inside. And you can see as the family gathers and the last survivors coming in, what they have to deal with on our Indian attack. If a person, if you're interested in going there, um, you know where Mifflin is, the little village of Mifflin. Uh, most of you know where the Johnny Appleseed Amphitheater used to be, okay, so it went kaput. So you just go by the, the, the entranceway to the Johnny Appleseed Amphitheater, go down to where the dam is, you know where the dam is, and then it turns, and just as you're turning there, you'll see a, a, a large sign that says Copas Massacre, but there'll be a dirt road, it's still dirt, or it was, and that was a lane, a pathway, and you go back there about a quarter of a mile on the right side is the monument where the cabin stood. And I think you folks said they moved the monument, which uh, I'm surprised they moved it, so we I don't know. We thought it was down closer to the beginning of the mud road. Okay, yeah. And they moved it up by the house up there. And you can still drink water out of the spring if you so desire, and I had to do it. I, I don't know how safe it was, but, you, you know, so you could go to the spring. It's right there. You can see it coming right out of the out of the rocks, and to know the history there. But what is sad about that whole thing, it all could have been avoided. All of it. All those people that were killed, there was no reason for that. And uh, John Chapman, known then as John Chapman, uh, played a very important role in the beginning of Richland County and Ashland County. Any f further questions? So the young girl that you carried from the... That, that was... The only survivor? No, no. Uh, the, 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 the mother survived. The soldier that made it into the cabin survived. That's why we have an eyewitness. He had to write up a military paper on it. And then his uh, two sons also survived. And one of the sons went with him before the massacre to Greentown to try to persuade them to leave peacefully. So we have his memoirs also. So we're, it's pretty well recorded of what happened with the Reverend James Copas. I mean, we, we have it down to the, the good statistics on that. And that was the only battle during the War of 1812 in this area, other than the Battle of Lake Erie, but for Richland County and Ashland County. But you have to remember one time there wasn't a Richland County and an Ashland County. People don't know that. But stay out of Mount Vernon. <laughs> he did not like Mount Vernon or Moses Cleveland. <laughs> but he, he owned two properties in Mount Vernon. I've seen him in the courthouse. He owned lot 127 and 128. John Chapman. He paid 50 apple trees for each right along the Kokosian River. I've been right there where the, the orchard was. So he was not a fabrication like Paul Bunyan. And I, when I taught school, some of the teachers would challenge me. Well, it's just a story like Paul Bunyan. No, there was a real John Chapman. He really lived. Speaking of Mount Vernon, the guy that wrote Dixie was from Mount Vernon. He did. That's absolutely, yeah. They right. said if he knew what they were going to do with it, he wouldn't have written it. <laughs> Any final questions anybody would have? Well, thank you for all coming out. This is really good attendance for the weather. Now, that's all go out in the woods to build a fire. Yes, I do. I'd like to thank Ken for coming tonight, and I'd like to remind everyone that next month, um, February 23rd, um, is our next speaker series. And the person that we will have here next month is Dave Repke. Now, Dave Repke um, runs the Hayesville Opera House down in Hayesville. And if you're not familiar with the area, you really don't know much about what happened here in Ashland County. Hayesville at one time was in the running for being the county seat of Ashland. So Ashland and Hayesville really got into it over who was going to be the county seat. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot 
uh, Mr. Chapman, of interesting history from that Hayesville area. And you would be surprised at the many um, famous and popular people who actually came through the Hayesville Opera House. Is that the Dave Rutke that plays piano and organ? No. No, different one. Um, but Dave is a very also accomplished historian of Ashland. He worked at Ashland College for many, many years, um, preserving Ashland University or Ashland College's history, as well as being a good friend at the Historical Society and now working to preserve the history of the Hayesville area and the Hayesville Opera House. So I think that's going to be super interesting. I know that um, he will deliver a great speech, so we invite you all to come. February 23rd, again, I I at 6.30. February 6th, out there on a sign. Um, it's, it's February 23rd. That might be trivia. We have trivia at Ohio Fire the first Tuesday of every month. So if you like trivia, come on down. It's a lot of fun.